Well, hey, I'm glad that you have joined us today. Uh, whether you're in our regular online community or this is your first time, or if you're joining us with the Cornerstone Inside membership in our California prisons, or if you're in one of the home groups meeting today in Hayward, uh, San Ramon, and Danville. And I want to open with a question for you. Uh, can I ask you a question? Is your prayer life satisfying to you? I mean, do you look forward to your talks with God? Uh, does your communication with Him give you spiritual strength? Or does it kind of feel like maybe a chore or it doesn't result in anything? Well, in today's text, Luke chapter 11, we read that one of Jesus' students asked him to teach them how to pray like he prayed. Uh, this unnamed disciple had no doubt noticed that the rabbi's alone time with the Father replenished him. Prayer, for Jesus anyway, was like uh, eating a good meal. He even told his students something just like that. He said, guys, I have food you don't know anything about. So his apprentices were keen to learn this new nourishing way of connecting with God, one that was different from the Hebrew prayers that they all chanted. So Jesus taught them a 30-second prayer, a prayer that could, could the, become the foundation for how they approached God from then on. Uh, so we call it the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father, where when we gather, we can pray this prayer and know for certain that God is hearing us, which is really important because many of us struggle to know what to say when we pray, especially in groups. Sometimes this is what keeps us from gathering in groups. If we fear we're going to be asked to pray out loud. Well, after today, I hope that fear begins to dissipate because from here on out, you can look super spiritual in those groups. You can have the Lord's Prayer ready for those situations. When it's your turn to pray out loud, you can just kind of say, you know, I think we should just do the Lord's Prayer. And everyone will go, she is so spiritual. Uh, and that can also be your outline for prayer when you pray alone, as each sentence becomes the baseline for other things you want to communicate with God on any given day. So here's what I'm saying. You could pray the first sentence of the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then you could stop, and before moving on, you could just sit with God's holiness or the fact that he's your father. You could talk to him about that for a while. And then when you finish talking to him about that, you could go to the second line of the prayer. Uh, the next thing you know, this 30-second prayer has become a 10 to 15-minute interaction with God that can be really meaningful. Now, some of, the, some of you tell us that you don't know what to say to God when you're alone. So I'm hoping that after today, you can just approach God like Jesus taught us and use these five sentences he gave us as your prayer outline. Jesus told them, if you want to pray like I pray, here's what to say. Our Father in heaven, hey, uh, wait, let's all pray the prayer together right now. Here we go. Our Father, come on, pray it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Isn't that great? What a great gift Christ gave us that day. You just can't go wrong praying the one and only prayer that the Son of God taught us. Now, what could be simpler? Jesus says to us, I've come from the Father. I know exactly how to talk to him because I talk to him constantly. I know how he thinks. I know that he wants you to approach him often, respectfully, but not with fear like a child approaching a good dad. And the advantage this prayer holds over any other prayer we might learn is that this is the only prayer Jesus taught us. We have been personally coached by none other than God's Son on exactly how to speak to his Father. Now, having said that about the Lord's Prayer, my memories of 
praying the Lord's Prayer in a group are not all that life-giving, uh, mainly because praying the Lord's Prayer in church somehow became less of a powerful connection with God and more of a religious exercise uh, where we clicked into perfect unison right when we began. Our Father, pause, who art in heaven, pause, hallowed be thy name, pause, ugh. With our eyes cast low and our voices affecting the monotone mumble of Winnie the Pooh's friend Eeyore, uh, we recited the prayer in perfect unison, interjecting 16, count them, 16 pauses that we all somehow knew to interject. And then everyone held their breath going into the stressful debts trespasses junction. This prayer, which was intended to become a well-used key, unlocking the door to God's presence and his blessing, has become a dull religious thing we all do together when the pastor or priest tells us to. Well, today we're changing all that. We're going to pull the prayer apart into its five components, looking at each sentence for what it offers, and then we'll put it all back together into something life-giving. And as we do this, I'm going to challenge our view of what prayer is even for. I think many times we approach prayer forgetting that it is not designed uh, to be us going to God asking Him for stuff. Instead, real prayer involves us approaching our Father in order to enter into what He is already doing and then framing our requests around His plan, which is already in motion. We don't approach our Father God with a, a wish list but with empty hands. We don't start with, now here's what I need from you. Quite the opposite. We open the Lord's Prayer reflecting on God's holiness and his availability, reminding ourselves of just how fantastic it is that he wants us to call him Abba, the Hebrew word for dad. Jesus told us that the Creator God wants to be called dad. It's respectful, but definitely not distant. And as any dad joining us today could tell you, when our children approach us with appropriate, respectful intimacy, we will move heaven and earth to meet their needs. It troubles us to think that they would ever feel that we are distant or unapproachable. And that's exactly how our Heavenly Father feels as well. Now, this carries huge implications. Not only for those of us who have been fortunate enough to have had good earthly fathers, but also for those who didn't. Some of you have felt ripped off by the abusive or absent dad you ended up with. Consequently, that person who has suffered under an extremely flawed earthly father might be prone to ask, is there some other way I could address God? The title dad just doesn't work for me. I don't want to think of God in the same way I think of my hard-to-love earthly father. But friend, that is exactly why you must get comfortable calling God Abba, Father. Pushing yourself to call him Dad will redefine the parent-child relationship in a way that honors God and at the same time heals you from the wounding from your flawed biological father. All right, moving on. Because Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Your very identity, who you really are, is beyond human comprehension. What you've already accomplished is far greater than any request we would bring today. This is so cool. Do you see what Jesus is teaching us? Just reminding ourselves of God's name activates our faith to ask for big things. God, your very name is hallowed. Now you may have heard this before, uh, that in the biblical way uh, of thinking, uh, a person's name is a reflection of all that they're capable of, all that you can expect from them. Uh, like Jacob's name originally meant one who deceives. Well, that guy lived up to that name. Abraham's name means father of nations, which he was. Jesus' name means God saves us. God the Father also has some awesome names. His names are both portraits and promises. 
And it would be good for us all to know a few of his names as we address him. Do you already know some of these names for God? What are your favorites? Well, I have a few. Uh, I love his name Elohim, which means the strong gods. It's actually in the plural, uh, reminding us that God is a trinity. Uh, God is a community, a strong cord of three strands that cannot be broken. I love his name El Shaddai, uh, the all-powerful God. That name is great to use whenever I feel overwhelmed or weak. Or the name Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. I call that name out when I'm in need. See, when we pray in God's name, we are uh, accessing his, uh, his ability and also, I think, his heart. So I think it would do your heart good this week to Google names of God and then begin to call out to the name that best reflects your present circumstances. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus calls God by one of his precious names, Abba. All right, one more thought before we move on. I want to point out the most common word in the Lord's Prayer, and I'm betting this will be a surprise to you. What do you think is the word most used in this prayer? You're gonna see it eight times in its different forms. Look at the prayer in your Bible for the words our, us, or we. It's all really the same word. It's the first person plural pronoun. Now, why is this important? Because it's plural. This prayer is designed to be prayed by a group more than it is to be prayed by an individual. It doesn't say my father, it is our father. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive. Lead us, deliver us. Jesus is teaching us to be an us. And to pray this prayer when we gather as children of a good father who is looking out for us. That we reflect on his holiness as a group. That we invite his will to invade our existence as the church gathered. This is when we're the most powerful. Not when we gather, but when we gather in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Almighty, then we become an extremely powerful force even when just two or three of us are gathered. And then we receive our daily bread as an us, and we break bread together as a community of faith, asking to be forgiven as a group for the sins the group has committed, challenging the group to corporately seek forgiveness and seek to be delivered from evil. Now, why is this so important? Well, because I think our tendency is to go it alone, especially when it comes to thinking about sin or temptation. Our tendency is not to receive daily bread and then look around and make sure everyone gets some. Our tendency is not to seek group forgiveness for sins committed by our particular group. We're way too individualistic in our thinking. The Lord's Prayer comes against individualistic thinking. It's all about groups of people gathering to honor his name and invite his kingdom to earth. A family gathered to receive provision and grace. But the thought of the group sinning is very difficult for us Americans. For us to lament or to grieve or to repent of something that we didn't necessarily individually do, but something that was done in our group. I mean, like in our country. To pray the Lord's Prayer as Americans would mean that we are asking God to forgive us, our sins, as a nation, and then deliver us from that evil. So let's ask ourselves, what are our American sins? And as individual Americans, are we willing to repent of terrible terrible things that have been done, even if we weren't personally involved? Wow, that's a lot to think about. But we need to move on. So let's move on to the second sentence in this five-sentence prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so what are we praying here? 
Well, it's nothing less than heaven's values, heaven's provisions, heaven's ways, heaven's king to rule on earth. What we're saying is we want our world to change. Think about it. Anything we will ever ask him to do has something to do with the world not being right. God, please heal my mother. God, please provide us food and shelter. God, please bring my prodigal home. God, please restore my broken relationship. Anything we ask from God ultimately stems from the reality that this world can be cruel, arbitrary, random, and unfair. The Bible teaches us that God sees us and that his desire is to fight our battles. So we pray Christ's prayer often, asking him to bring heaven to earth in our personal lives and also in our communities and in our country. We often start prayers thinking mainly of our own needs, but then as we begin to embrace our role as Christ's ambassadors, we begin to intercede for our neighbors near and far. And as we learn not to initially approach God with only what we want, we learn to ask him what he wants, not just for us, but for all of us, and how we can somehow be a part of that. We pray, your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, say that with me. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth exactly like it is in heaven. Well, wow, that's a big, big request. And you know, a funny thing happens when his kingdom comes, our kingdom goes. Our decisions, our conclusions, our control, all of these have to be subordinated to his will and his control whenever we ask him to join us. We ask him to be in charge. God simply cannot be part of any group, any endeavor, any project where he's not in charge. He is who he is, he said to Moses. He's the God who exists. And whenever you're with the God who exists, you're not the God who exists. And having said that, God's ways are not our ways. His ways are better, but they're different. So uh, if we don't know what to expect when we pray, uh, if we actually kind of expect God to do what we told him to do, we are often disappointed. If we thought uh, that praying meant asking God for healing or provisions and then automatically we would receive those things, when we don't get the answer we, re we expected, uh, we can feel like he either didn't hear us, he just doesn't care. Well, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is recalibrating our expectations of what should happen after we pray. He's saying, don't expect God to always do exactly what you asked. Uh, instead, when you pray, relinquish control of the whole problem to God and decide to trust him to do things his way in his timeline. Bring the problem to God, not the potential solution. Bring the problem to God without making suggestions on how he should solve things. Let his perfect plan Replace your flawed ideas. All my life, I've been saying this phrase in this prayer, thy will be done, thy will be done, with very little appreciation for how much my life should have changed as a result of me saying those words repeatedly, that my will, my decisions, my opinions, my actions, those things will not be done. Those all have to be submitted to God's purpose, and God's ways are above my ways. God's will is above my will. You know, that's why Jesus came, by the way. He brought God's will to earth, God's plans. And praying this prayer will remind us of that. As we sit with this second sentence, we reflect on whatever it means on any given day. We pray, Father, only you will be able to fix this world we're going out into today. Bring your kingdom here. Take charge of what we do. Take charge of why we do it and how we do it. Just let us know how we can cooperate with you as you bring heaven to earth today. I'm convinced that after praying a prayer like this each morning, we would be more likely to go out into the day looking for opportunities to live out a more loving, just, truthful, gracious way of living. Our ears will be tuned to a holy frequency as we represent heaven 
on earth in every human interaction that day. Uh, actions that set us apart from what the world is used to. That's pretty cool, to be different than what the world is used to. And you know the beautiful thing about this is that we don't have to come up with the plan. We don't even have to come up with the energy to do it. We just have to be willing to hear and to obey God and invite his Holy Spirit to help us. And it's certain that Jesus knew exactly what he meant when he instructed us to pray this way. It's equally certain that uh, he's fully aware that we don't know the first thing about how to bring heaven to earth. That's why he doesn't tell us, get out there and get busy doing God's will. No, instead he tells us to sit with the Father and ask him to bring heaven to earth. If we can keep our senses attuned to this reality, we will often succeed, usually through many small gestures and daily actions, maybe even going unnoticed, but we are bringing the kingdom of God to earth. As we get better at listening to his voice, and especially when he's saying to us, stop doing things that way, that's earth's way. Do it like this. This is heaven's way. So as we pray the Lord's Prayer this week, let's take our hands off the controls. Let's not do God's planning for him. Let's say to the Father, your plan, your plan, whatever it may be, is now our plan. And our stuff, our relationships, our talents, everything we have is at your disposal. Uh, just like you've made all your infinite resources available to us, we also offer our meager stash as well. as If there's anything that, that, that we have that you could utilize to make earth more heaven-like today for someone else, whoa, do whatever you need to do to bring heaven to my neighborhood. And if you can use my help at any point, God, just let me know. All right. I hate to move on because there's so many thoughts in each one of these sentences, but I'm trying to cover the whole prayer here. Uh, so let's move on to the next sentence. Give us today our daily bread, which would remind the original listeners of the manna that the Israelites collected each morning as God provided food for them one day at a time for 40 years. That concept is lost on us with our large pantries and our double-wide refrigerators, just waiting for the next Costco trip. Um, so daily bread, I'm not sure we're ever really gonna get that, but daily bread is more than bread. Maybe when you prayed this prayer as a child, you pictured actual bread. I mean, I did. I pictured God dropping off Wonder Bread at our house in those clear plastic bags with red, blue and yellow bubbles. I remember five-year-old Steve wondering, why do we only pray for bread? And why don't we pray for peanut butter and jelly and not chunky peanut butter? I mean, why did, why did we stop with bread? Of course, now I know that Jesus wasn't just talking about bread, but about everything we need each day. When we pray this prayer, we are admitting that life is lived one day at a time. Wow, that's so good, we need to say it together. Life is lived one day at a time. Uh, and you know what? You're most content when we don't look too far ahead. Uh, all we really have is today. We don't have tomorrow. That's an assumption. So all we really need is what we need today. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about your daily needs. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need today. Uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself, he said. Praying the Lord's Prayer puts us in this mindset, asking God to make good on the promise to provide everything we need for the next 24 hours like he has done for his people since the Exodus. Uh, tomorrow is, is uncertain, but what is certain is that God is going to meet today's needs today. Let's keep moving. The next sentence Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hmm. You know, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are in essence allowing the Father to take some things completely out of our hands. And that's a very good thing. In the first three sentences of the prayer, we loosened our grip on our own plans, freeing us to reach out for His plan. We handed Him our worries, allowing our anxiety ah, to be replaced by a calm faith. Now, let's let go of unforgiveness. 
allowing God to forgive us completely, we must forgive ourselves, releasing the guilt and shame of our own sins. Now, maybe you have trouble forgiving yourself because your sin was so awful. I get that. But Christ's payment was also awful and enough to redeem you from continuing to pay. I mean, maybe you secretly believe you should stay in shame for what you did. But have you considered that Jesus was spat upon, slapped, mocked, publicly beaten, and crucified naked in order to be shamed? Jesus chose extreme shame so that when you feel deeply embarrassed about what you did, you can remind yourself that his shame more than paid for yours. Trying to pay for your own shame is an affront to the mercy and goodness of God. Make up your mind that you're going to let yourself out of this imaginary penalty box, even if you have to do it several times an hour. Then, completely forgive anyone who has hurt you. That's a tough one. All of us have been sinned against. Being deeply wronged by someone you trusted is one of the most difficult blows that life will deal you. Being stabbed in the back, ah, uh, that wound is so hard. But I'm telling you, you must forgive for their sake and especially for your sake. The Father commands us to forgive others because he loves them, but also because he loves us. He knows that when we refuse to forgive them, we're hurting ourselves. Unforgiveness will impede your progress and stunt your growth. It will eat you up from the inside out. Receiving forgiveness from God is therefore linked to giving it out to others. Jesus said exactly that, that we will be forgiven with the same measure we use to forgive others. Because forgiving others is the main way we've proved to ourselves that we have been forgiven. Uh, if we're really receiving mercy, we'll be really ready to give, in, to give it out. Now, does it make it fair? It may not seem fair that that person who hurt us is, so deeply is being forgiven. By rights, they should have to pay for what they did. But then think about that. If you're going to hold to that, you have to play by the same rules. Do you want to pay for your sins? I certainly don't want to pay for mine. You know, earlier when we were praying about the, uh, the daily bread, we talked about how God provides for us each day. Uh, this is also true for grace and mercy, which the Bible says is new each morning, like manna. If we allow him to, God will top off our grace cup each day so that we have plenty to give ourselves and plenty to give to others. Eventually, forgiveness becomes our go-to response, and we become a part of God bringing heaven to earth. Wow, this is great. Let's go, let's move along. Uh, fourth sentence is the prayer, which is what? Lead us not into temptation. Say it. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Oh, you'll get a kick out of this. Recent research conducted at Cambridge University proved what we knew all along, that the longer a person lingers near temptation, the more apt they are to give in. Just a matter of time. Now, in this clinical test, volunteers were enticed by various items while equipment measured their brain waves. Before starting the timer, the test subjects were allowed to pre-commit to some of the items being placed nearby while other things, other things that would tempt them were more difficult to access. Now, as time went by, resolve definitely broke down. But the test subjects were much more successful resisting temptation if the item or experience that was tempting them was more difficult to get to. And here is one of the astute scientific conclusions of the researchers. And I quote, the best strategy to resist cookies is to remove the cookie jar from the room. Wow, who knew? Uh, just make sure that the cookie jar is hard to get to. Revolutionary. Well, we knew this, that we shouldn't trust so much in our own stamina when it comes to anything our weak flesh might want. 
Uh, we're taught by Jesus to ask our Father to lead us away from whatever bad thing we know we might consider doing. Now, according to the book of James, we are often our own worst enemy. As much as we want to blame the devil, we tempt ourselves. We're the ones who purchased that alcohol and brought it home, not the devil. We neglected installing accountability software on our screens. We tempted ourselves, mainly because, get this, we like sin. We want to sin. Something good happens once we honestly admit that we want to sin. Once we admit it to ourselves and to God, we are humbled. Uh, we become much more vigilant. Are, are, uh, vigilant? Is that a word? I know there's the vigilant people. You see a YMCA. No, vigilant. It's vigilant. We become much more vigilant. Our eyes wide open, pre-committing not to stumble. Asking our Father to lead us away from temptation. We can also increase the likelihood of success when we admit our weakness to a trusted accountability group. And we text them when we're being tempted. When we remain in lonely isolation, we are way more vulnerable to stumble. All right, that's enough of me talking. It's time for the discussion to begin. I have shared these things with you in the sincere hope that the only prayer that Jesus taught us to pray will now come alive for you. So let's transition into our discussions now by praying the prayer Jesus taught us to pray when he said, pray with me, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.